Hi everyone, this is the TLDR video for week 5 for Advanced Security. This week we're going to be talking about exploitation and how that is the next phase in the pen testing process. So what we've talked about so far is how we do reconnaissance and enumeration and how we are going to be putting together a plan for how we are going about our pen test. Now, the next phase of this is exploitation. So the recon is really showing us the big picture. Enumeration is finding where the vulnerabilities are. And exploitation is then taking advantage of those vulnerabilities. Now, you want to think about this as a precision type of thing. This is a scalpel, not a shotgun. We're not doing a smash and grab here. We should have a high value target or preferably list of targets. Remember, we are the ethical hackers. If the exploitation involves taking down a system, the company losing money during the pen test, then we're not doing it right. That is absolutely not what we should be doing. We are trying to look at this as what is something that an attacker might do? How would they take advantage of this? And we have to make sure that we are very careful that we aren't doing damage as we're going about this. Now, I've sort of split exploits into two categories custom and public. Now, public exploits are known exploits. They are ones that are already in common places, in common tools. They are already out there and public. Tailored exploits or custom exploits, this requires more skill, more programming knowledge, and systems knowledge. So this is where you might actually be able to find or create a way to take advantage of an exploit that isn't previously known. They would be tested on your own systems in a way that would, you basically make a mock-up of the target system and then do the test. Zero days are a last resort. Now, part of the reason that these zero days or custom exploits are considered a last resort is it's unlikely that a company is going to be facing that. Most malicious attackers aren't sophisticated enough to come up with these custom exploits. They're more along the lines of script kitties. So you want to plan for what the bulk of the issues are going to be, not the sort of one-off. Now, that's not always going to be the case. If we're talking about, you know, nation state hacking, that's a completely different ball game than talking about just like a regular company, small, medium, or even larger, depending on what it is that they're working on. Now, some examples of exploitation. We could look at exploiting people. This is where we have social engineering or physical security. We could look at operating system exploits, memory or buffer overflow. Those are always really popular. Man in the middle type attacks, Wi-Fi proximity type of attacks are all good examples of exploitation. Now, when we're talking about exploiting people, we would talk about this as social engineering or layer eight. If you're interested, there's uh, conferences and tracks in conferences that are completely focused on this. And you want to think about how the social engineering attack is going to end up happening. Um, this PowerPoint is in Blackboard and it's got a link to Science Direct here if you're interested in a more specific walkthrough for how to do this, you can go look up the social engineering track at, you know, something like DEF CON or the Layer 8 conference if you want to have more details about this. Now, some social engineering red flags that are important to think about. You want to look at who, in this case, we're talking about emails. Who's the email coming from? Do you recognize the sender? Um, is it someone from outside the organization? Do you know them? Do you already have a previous relationship? Look at who it's going to. Is it going to you, a whole bunch of people? Are there any hyperlinks? Have they been shortened? Look at the date of the email. Is it at sort of a funny time? Look at the subject of the email. Does it seem irrelevant? Is this something that you expected? Were you not expecting it? 
look at the attachments. It's probably a good idea to only open attachments if you were specifically expecting them. And then look at the actual content. Are there spelling errors, grammatical errors that you weren't expecting? Uh, is this out of the ordinary? Are they asking for something or pressuring you into doing things? If you are interested, Reddit, which I've actually linked in here, Reddit did an AMA, uh, Ask Me Anything, from a professional social engineer that was very interesting if you would like to learn a little bit more about that. Now, the demo activity, we are going to be skipping right over that one. That's not something I can have you all do at home. So then continuing with exploitation. So a zero day exploit, we can then use that to do something called pivoting. The idea behind a pivot is where you are getting into a company and then attacking from a machine that is already in the company. You're using that compromised system to go attack other systems. So let's say you compromise a printer. Printers are unfortunately a really great source of pivot points because they tend to be attack they tend to be on the internet. They tend to not get updated. They tend to be connected to everything and have a bunch of privileges. So let's say you get access to the printer. You could then pivot from the printer to go attack other things in the network. You'll sometimes also see this referred to as island hopping. Proxy pivoting is when you're channeling all your traffic through that pivot point, such as a printer. You can also do a VPN pivot where you're directing traffic through an encrypted layer tunneling into your target. So the sort of bad joke that I usually make is I'm calling from inside your house. Now, when we talk about exploits in general, known exploits actually have classifications. So MITRE has the CVE classifications at cve.mitre.org. It's been trademarked by MITRE, but it's a free and open standard sponsored by DHS and CISA, the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. There is also um, the National Vulnerability database. All of the exploits that are in here are being scored to determine the risk, and these databases are used as references for vulnerability scanners. So it's basically like somebody found a vulnerability, it gets submitted to the database. Tools will look at these databases so that we can go and say, hey, are any of these known vulnerabilities in the system? Oh, looks like we have a couple, let's go fix that. Do we need to patch? Do we need to update? Whatever it happens to be. So then we can talk about how to report an exploit. So let's say we're going about our everyday business and it turns out we actually found something and we can't figure out, you know, sort of what we should do with it. So you can actually report an exploit and there is something called bug bounties that we're going to talk about in a second. And the idea is every exploit has an ID. You can report an exploit to this um, company so that you can actually make sure that it's shared properly with others. Now, all of that being said, there are some huge legal issues with reporting exploits. Some companies are very much on board. They will even pay you if you can find something wrong with their product. Some companies are very much not on board and will not only not pay you, they would be more likely to sue you. So it's actually really important that you are careful which companies you're doing research on. So when you are reporting exploits, it's very important that you are doing this in not just an ethical manner, but only for people that are basically asking. You can kind of think about it like help is only help if it's welcomed. You can't help someone against their will. Now there's research and then there's accidental. There are security researchers that will spend a whole bunch of time and energy and effort trying to find these zero days. They will go to contests, they will make money from bug bounties, and they are definitely really good at it. 
There's also the accidental. It's completely possible that you've accidentally found an exploit, something where you can make a software, hardware, do something that it wasn't intended to do just because you're playing around with it. One of the things about exploits is the more familiar you are with a product, the more you know its limitations, and therefore the more likely you'll be able to find the extent of the limitations. But these accidentals tend to be more like, oh, whoops, I didn't really know. But again, I would strongly encourage you to go look up the vulnerability disclosures and the EFF's vulnerability reporting FAQ because there is absolutely some potential trouble that you can get into. Now, on that, you can think about the companies that actually want us to help them. This is bug bounties. The basics of bug bounties. You find a bug, you report a bug, they give you the pretty, pretty money. Now, some companies are willing to work with you and others. There's something called public bug bounties. Um, and this is basically like there's companies that keep track of bug bounties and help you get paid out for them. There's private bug bounties where it's invite only. Uh, you'll generally tend to see this with companies that are working on things that are more secretive. So uh, government agencies, third party R&D type companies will generally do invite only because they are very concerned about sort of opening it up to the public free for all. Now, vulnerability disclosure policies, there's always going to be very clear lines for how you need to report the bug, and it's very important that you follow those clear lines. I've included a PowerPoint by the Fluffy007 on Twitter, uh, Jasmine Jackson, apologies if I pronounced your name incorrectly, and that's in the learning module. She put together a really nice PowerPoint on how to go about doing bug bounties. She has a lot of experience with them. And an activity that you can absolutely go do from home, sign up for one of the bug bounty programs. You can't report it to the class the same way but go to either hackerone.com or bugcrowd.com, create a free account. These should both be free. Do not pay for this. And then look at what's out there for bug bounty. See if there's something you want to play with. You don't have to submit anything. Maybe you'll find something. Um, there's smaller bugs for a couple hundred bucks. There's bigger bugs for a couple grand. And if you are interested in getting into security, this can be a nice way to find some interesting things and get paid while you do it. Now, the next thing that sort of comes along with bugs is patch management. So patch management is how a company is going to go about updating their software operating system or applications. Patch management is taking the vulnerabilities that have been found and then basically going through a triage. How important is this vulnerability? Now, the vulnerabilities can be anything from this isn't great and we should fix it soon to the pseudo vulnerability in Linux that allowed people to use pseudo even if they weren't in the pseudoers group, uh, which so bad, so bad. So they're going to go about triaging and then deciding what they need to work on sort of in order of importance. And most of these patches will usually be coming from the vendors. The vendors will be creating these fixes. Not always. Sometimes the public will create these fixes. Kind of depends on the program. The application exploits, the sort of, I guess, riskiest uh, browsers are always going to be risky because as soon as you're interacting with the public, risks happen. Um, if you don't believe me, watch from very, very far away people interacting at the holiday season or uh, hopefully in the future, this will not be the case. But if we are still in a pandemic, just watch people like literally anybody on the street and see how risky that is. Um, we could also look at some of the other riskier behaviors such as PDF, Flash, which has thankfully died, um, 
and office applications that use macros. Those tend to be some of the riskier applications that are easier to find bugs in. Legacy applications, legacy being things that are still being used but are no longer being kept up to date is obviously also going to have a lot more problems. Now, secure programming is sort of a little bit of an offshoot of this. DevOps is when you are getting your developers to automate manually done processes. DevSecOps is when you are embedding security into the process of your DevOps. So if you have development processes, security or DevSecOps is where we are actually embedding security into the entire thing as we are going through our DevOps. So that means that the code analysis is going to include security. And that's going to either include dynamic testing or static testing. We are going to have security training so that all of the developers know how important it is to write code, vulnerability management and threat investigation so that we're having sort of everybody have some skin in the game in terms of how important security is. So that's kind of getting the developers on board and the DevOps people on board. Now this is going to come with test your code. Please, please never submit code that is not tested. I know this is in the heavy coding class, but I, I just please never submit code that is not tested. It should work. It probably works. I think it works. Are not acceptable in any environment ever under any circumstances. Now, there's a whole bunch of tools that are out there to test your programs. Most languages will have a selection of tools to allow you to test your code. Either static testers, where we're just going through and checking the code, or dynamic testers, where it's watching what the code does and the different behaviors. There's also something called fuzzers. Fuzzers are where it's going to take malformed data using automation and then put it in. So let's say, for example, you have a program that adds two numbers. That should be a relatively simple, you know, number plus number equals number. Okay, so what happens if I use very, very large numbers? A um, thousand digits, 10,000 digits. What if I use very, very small numbers? Fractions of a number. What if I use binary sequences? What if I pass it characters? What if I pass it strings? What if I pass it unsigned numbers? How will your program handle all of those different things? Now that's a very simple program that's literally just adding two numbers together. And those are all of the things that are relatively obvious of what we could do to mess that up. So fuzzers give us the ability to go through and check all of these things. So this is actually pretty important for being able to make sure that your code is actually okay. Now, normally the activity that we would do is I would have everybody go to one of the exploit databases, find an exploit, tell the class what you found. Obviously that's not going to work here. So what I would encourage you to do is pick one of these exploit databases that I've linked, um, you know, Rabbit7, Vulnerable Database Hub, ExploitDB, NIST.gov, vulnerabilities, whatever. Go find one, read about it. How is it put together? How does it work? How did they report it? Do they have a proof of concept? What is the proof of concept? And just go and look at it and see what you find. I think you might be able to find something really interesting. Please let me know if you have questions.